This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, makers of Australian sea salt since 1948. You know, I think that to go out the way that we want under our own terms and as a celebration on the highest note possible, like that's maybe the the gift back to Sayobo in that it deserves it deserves the best possible goodbye. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The events of last year have created opportunity, altered the way professionals run their business, and given them pause to consider change. Last time we caught up with Kylie Javier Ashton, she talked of the personal toll and burnout that running one of Australia's best restaurants had taken on her. She also talked about the amazing impact that Mama Fuku Siobo has had on her life. After the initial lockdown, she reopened the restaurant with new energy and enthusiasm. But a year since the pandemic hit down under comes the news of the closure of one of the great restaurants. Kylie, how are you going? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us again. Some big changes have happened for Mamafuku over the entire year. It's been quite a whirlwind sort of period. Um, before we talk about the reasons of, of closing down, can you tell us a bit about what it was like reopening with the, the new energy and enthusiasm and offering that you, you guys put together? Yeah, um, well, I guess, you know, just that sense of being back at work was just so great for our whole team. Um, I think that we rethought the restaurant from everything that we did, we, we changed basically because we really wanted to create a restaurant for the future um, and something that was sustainable both for our team um, and business-wise. And so the energy was has been amazing. Um, we work with a much smaller team now, so we reduced our team size probably by about half um, and then reduced our working week to four days. Um, our restaurant capacity has reduced um, and we've kind of kept it that way because what now we do two sittings. So, you know, where we would stagger sittings throughout um, the night and have people come in, you know, every half hour. Now we sit the whole restaurant um, at the same time and we do that twice a night. So we almost have two services a night um, to allow for that you know, to be financially viable too. So, you know, like I think that um, all of the things that we really wanted to implement in our restaurant um, and a lot of goals that we were working towards pre-pandemic, we were really able to set those plans into motion when we reopened because, you know, look, it's it's hard to change direction when you're on a on a momentum already, but when you're starting from zero and you're able to to start from um, from a stopping position, you can kind of like set your goals and it's a lot easier to implement a lot of those changes now that we'd had like this hard reset. So it was, it's been great. It, you know, we work four days a week, three days off um, our team, has energy throughout the week. You know, we still work fairly long hours, but it's nowhere near what we were sort of working before um, before the pandemic hit. And, and there are things that I think as an industry we've all been really working towards for a long time. The conversation was there, but just it was really difficult because we were already on this on this momentum, so to to change, you know, and with with the with things like that in mind, you really do have to change the way you think. You change the culture of your business. You have to change the way that you do everything um, to to fit that around that. So it was much easier to be able to create those changes um, moving forward, coming out of the pandemic. What was it like uh, from an operational perspective? You mentioned that the restaurant used to run staggering bookings and then it turned into two seatings. Was it was it a big change for you guys? Yes and no. I think um, people were much more open-minded coming out of the pandemic. So now we do two sittings at 5.45 and then at 8.30, um, whereas before – 
the pandemic, people wouldn't be open to doing a 545 booking. You know, they don't have time to come from work. But now that a lot of people are working from home, like 545 is a doable time. So I think people were much more open-minded in the way that they could eat and the way that restaurants operated. Um, I think having that taken away from a from people for a period of time as well made us realise, made everybody realise that, like, you know, we also need to support the businesses. It has to be a two-way street and it has to be a relationship that goes both ways and it's not, I think, you know, it's very easy to get kind of caught making um I don't know, just making compromises constantly, but it it always felt like we were always wanting to create this amazing experience for our guests, but that always came first and sometimes at the detriment of the business and of the team. And I, I think that like we really kind of dug our heels in and were like, you know, what is best for us and our team will also be best for the guests because it means that we can give ourselves a hundred percent, um, and be present and be energetic and, and not be burnt out. And I think that that was really important with what we created coming back. The restaurants had a beautiful evolution since inception in Australia and has been highly influential and, um, right at the top in regards to the best restaurants, but it's also had two identities in regards to food over the years. Can you take us on a little bit of a journey about, what the restaurant was like under Ben Greeno with that food and and the transition and um, experience that Paul Carmichael delivered? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess with Ben's food, um, there was still, as you know, that was right at the beginning of, of Sayobo time. So, you know, there was, there was Ben, there was also Dave's influence as well um, when we first opened. It was, I think... Uh, Mamafuku Sayobo or Mamafuku restaurants in general are quite difficult to define because they can't easily be categorized. Um, but I think that, you know, there was definitely much more of an, uh, an Asian influence when we first opened, like we had, uh, the Mamafuku pork buns on the menu. We, we used to serve a bosam right at the end, um, as like the petty four, which is like a Korean, like slow cooked pork shoulder that we used to do right at the end, which people just used to pick at with their fingers. But then, you know, Ben with his, um, European background and training, there was a lot of that, you know, he, he had come from Noma previous to working for Mamafuku. So, you know, that kind of, I guess, um, food ethos was definitely there, uh, but working with Australian ingredients. So I think, you know, categorizing Sayoba was always difficult from the beginning. Um, we always just said that we created cooked delicious food, but there was definitely that lean towards Asian, European, very traditional, um, I guess, dining. And I think that was also sort of groundbreaking for Sydney, having an international chef like David Chang coming to Sydney and opening here was massive news. And, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to work for Momofuku in the first place is like I wanted to know what an international restaurant group operated like. That was, that really intrigued me. Um, not so much, I mean, the food, yes, definitely. Of course it was Again, like it, it was, I think the vibe was much more serious back um, when we first opened, but it was still, you know, loud music. Um, everything was pulled back. Like we've never had tablecloths, yet you're operating on this really high level with food and service and wine. So everything, all, all the structure, um, is I guess a fine dining structure, but everything else was just who we were, you know. It was a little bit rogue. It was a bit <laughs> anti-establishment in, in a sense where we just didn't kind of follow rules. And that's what I've always loved about the ethos of Momofuku um, is that you're allowed to be somebody else other than what everybody tells you you should be. Um, And then when Paul arrived in 2015, um, we started to, I guess, well, he, his first menu dabbled in his Caribbean 
um, heritage and it still it still felt very um, I guess similar to the first iteration of Sayobo but as the years have gone on and now Paul's been here six years um, we've really committed to being a Caribbean restaurant which is a lot easier to uh, to categorize but people still don't understand what that is. <laughs> well, you went on a trip to the Caribbean and met Paul's family. Can you tell us about that experience and the sort of food that you experienced there? Yeah, so in 2017, um, my husband Luke and I um, went on a vacation and um, I'd, I've always wanted to go to Cuba. That's probably been one of my number one um, travel destination you know, goals that I've ever, I've wanted to go to, like my dog's named Cuba. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I decided like we need to go to Cuba. And now that we're in the Caribbean, um, I'd really love to go to Barbados because I'd been working with Paul for about two years at that stage. And so I was, I mean, I never do things in halves. And so like when I commit to something, like I really commit. So yeah, Paul was like, yes, please go see my family. They would love that. Um, and so we went and spent four days with them, but it honestly felt like a lot longer cause it's just, it's paradise there. And a day feels like a week, you know, like you feel like you've been on holidays for, forever. And, um, basically like they just welcomed us into the family as if we were their own. They are amazing people. And it just really helped me understand Paul. It helped me to understand Caribbean food and culture a little bit better and feel connected to that in a way that was much more personal. Um, but basically his mom cooked for us four days solid. I don't know. I just felt incredibly at home. Um, she, there was one day where Paul was like, okay, mom, I want you to cook Kylie and Luke like as much as you can. Like these are the re- things that we've got in the restaurant. So but she was like, oh, but you know, like I don't know how he's like, just give them little bits. Like you don't have to cook them the whole thing, but just cook, like serve them a little bit of this so that they can taste, you know, different, the different dishes. But she literally like the first dish that we made was cuckoo, which is like, it's like the national dish of Barbados. And it's kind of like a cornmeal. They serve it with salted fish. Um, but it's sorry, cornmeal with okra. Okra is, I should mention okra because it's like the main important (laughs) part of the dish. Um, but they cook the cornmeal with, with okra and it like helps thicken, the cornmeal, but then you also serve the boiled okra on the side and then um, salted fish, which is like super important in the Caribbean. That's like their salty crunch seasoning almost to, to the dish. So we cooked that, but it was literally like a plateful. And then she had like three other things like planned for that meal. And we were like, <laughs> oh my God, there is so much food. Um, but yeah, it was just like, being able to spend time with his family, I think was really, really special and, and helped me just understand who Paul is on a, on a deeper level. And, um, I just, yeah, I feel so connected to his family, but also Bayesian, um, culture, I think is very similar to Filipino, my Filipino background in that, you know, they're very, it's, it's a very, um, well, a very Christian culture for starters. So my family's quite religious. Um, and you know, throughout the Caribbean, because they were colonized by Europeans, generally a lot of them are, are, are like, there are a lot, of, there's a lot of Christianity throughout. So that kind of sense of that being part of the culture, but also being, um, I don't know, the ingredients, a lot of the ingredients even are quite similar to Asia because, you know, the Asia and Pacific, a lot of the same um, ingredients you'll you'll find, but they're just worked with very differently. Um, so that was, yeah, uh, like I now call Paul's mum and dad, mum and dad as well, and <laughs> we keep in contact with them. But, you know, from the word go, she was like, we love you, we're going to adopt you, and we were like, great. So the whole time we were there, I, I called Pearson, which is his dad, and Orlin, his mom, mom and dad, and we stayed there, and it was like we were at home. It was just, yeah, it was an impre- pretty incredible experience, and probably something that you know, um, 
I think one of the greatest gifts that I have been given through this whole experience is Paul and his family, I would say. This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, makers of Australian sea salt since 1948. The sea has given my family everything. My family harvests the pristine waters from the Great Australian Bight to make some of the best sea salt in the world. Hi, I'm Alex Olson from Olson Sea Salt. We are the oldest family-owned salt company in Australia. We took over the leases of Pacific Salt in Baruka on the York Peninsula in the early 1960s. And then when the BHP salt leases in Wyala became available, my father took those over as well. If anyone has visited Wyala, I know it's a very, very windy place. So the three things you need to make salt are seawater, wind and sun, and you get plenty of all three of those here. Wind is a really important factor in making good sea salt because it creates a greater surface area for the sun to evaporate the water, creating brine much faster. We take the seawater from Great Australian Bight and then we store it in something called a primary pond. Then it's fed through a succession of ponds from anywhere between eight months and two years until it gets so heavy in brine and the water is evaporated off, the salt starts to fall out of the water and it's as simple as that. That's all that we do and we wash it in seawater and package it. For more information, go to olsons.com.au. Well, you've been running the ship sort of the whole time. What's it, what's it been like um, being part of Mamafuku for for its lifespan and the influence that it's had, what sort of impact has it had on you? Um, I mean, well, it's defined a lot of who I am um, and it's given me a home for sure. I think that it's really hard to find a place where you feel at home. I know that that sounds weird, but... Uh, when you when you're working in restaurants like you do you, you do it's a labor of love you give so much of yourself to the people working in the restaurant the people who are dining in the restaurant um to the day-to-day running of the business like you know you you have to be so invested in everything so um you know it gave me somewhere where i felt like i belonged um and again like this sense of family that I received from Sayobo. Um, people have always been incredibly supportive. It's been hard for sure. Um, it's brought me to my knees many times where I thought that I just couldn't keep going. Like I did not expect to be there in nine years. Um, and there is a time where I tried to quit that that didn't really work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that it really taught me that taught me so much resilience and it showed me what kind of a person I was like, you know, to myself, I only like, I, yes, of course, like there, there have been times where I wanted to like prove things to everybody else. But I think Sayobo taught me like the only person I need to prove anything to is, is me. And um, being able to do something for myself because I wanted it and to knuckle down and have that resilience and to stick with something and to, um, to I don't know, have a, have a say I think is something that was really important for me at Sayobo. Like I've always in any place that I've worked treated it as if it was my own restaurant but I was really like gifted Sayobo. I also t- took it for myself too, you know, like no one handed it to me on a, on a silver platter and said like, yeah, I had to fight to have my voice heard many times. Like, like you do in any place, it's not, you know, you've got to, you've got to own your place. And I think that I, I truly did that at Sayobo. And I, for, for me, like it taught me that, yeah, I have a voice and that it's a valid voice. And I think that that was incredibly valuable for me as an individual to, to feel so empowered that I mattered in the restaurant. There's no doubt of the influence and impact that Mamafuku made 
on the culinary landscape in the last nine years. Well, what do you think it gave the industry and how it will be remembered? Um, I really hope that um, it is remembered for, I guess, its celebration of diversity, I think, is the big thing for me. Um it has become a safe place for many different people, um, but it's become a voice for diversity. And I think that the diversity piece is important and it's being talked about, but it can often come across as tokenistic. I know that that sounds, you know, I don't, I don't like to be negative about these things, um, but It's easy to say we support diversity and you matter and we want everyone to feel safe, but then for the leaders to not really represent any diversity. You know, I have a real problem with that because never in a million years did I ever think that, A, you know, I could be somebody that mattered in a restaurant and B, that I could be somebody that mattered in the industry just because I never saw people like me as true as leaders, you know, like there, of course there have been people typically in history, but just, you know, restaurant, restaurateurs, restaurant managers, people who are celebrated tend to not look like me. And the fact that our leadership team is incredibly diverse is something that I'm so proud of. But it has become a place that diversity is not only celebrated, but it's valued. And I think that that's the difference Um, where we are putting food that represents slavery on a pedestal and saying this is important and we're not trying to westernise it. We're not trying to make it look like European food or taste like European food, not taking the spice out of it. We're not, you know, gentrifying it. It is what it is and it has value. And we're not going to try to make it anything other than what it is. And we've had people who have come into the restaurant and not understood that and said, you know, it's too expensive for what it is. It's too expensive for like it's street food, you know, but it's like, yeah, it could be street food in one context, but why can't it be food that is valued in a fine dining restaurant in another context? Like they both have value. And the thing that you're really paying for is time. Like, and that's something that, you know, I think people look at a plate and they're like, oh, well, you know, rice is cheap. This it's a vegetable that is cheap. Or, you know, you, yeah, of course, like, but a dish is not, just the sum of its parts, you know, it, it's so much more than that. And understanding like the layers of what is important and that's, you know, again, you're, the, people, the people are the most important thing, I think, in any restaurant. Above the food, above the service, it's the people that are important. People's time is valuable and, you know, that's something that, I truly believe like we all deserve to be paid what we're worth. Um, And yeah, I don't know, like, and again, supporting that piece on diversity. So we're not going to say a bunch of things that we care about and that we value and then not back it up. If anything, like we we will always undersell and over deliver and make sure that, you know what, like the people who are in the restaurant, they feel cared for, they feel safe, they feel valued, they feel like they're we're invested in them and their future and that's going to translate in every other part of what we do because the people who come into our doors and the guests who come into our doors, they're going to feel safe and cared for and valued in the same way that we, we care for our team. And I don't know, I think that like hospitality often is – you know, it's a, it's a business about people and we forget that everybody forgets that we think it's a food and beverage business and it is, but I think the more, the most important thing is it's, 
it's about people. It's about feeding people. It's about service to people. The restaurant has won many accolades and you've personally received many accolades as well. But as someone who's worked day in, day out in the restaurant, what's been some of the highlights for you over the years? Um, I I think really just seeing like our, the people who have come out of Sayobo doing really awesome things. Um, that's probably like one of my greatest, I don't know, joys to see like, yeah, people, it's like having, seeing your, your kids like go out and then like be amazing people. You're like, oh, cool. You know, we, we did something good, I guess. Not to, I'm not trying to say that like we're taking any credit for it, but it's amazing that like we've had so many people through our doors. Um, I don't know. I think that like, yeah, just the people who are regulars in our restaurant, like that's been forming relationships has been our biggest, our biggest, I don't know, um, achievement. I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. I'm not good at thinking about this kind of stuff. But one thing I will say is that, the other day, like after we made our announcements, one of our regulars, who's a pretty quiet guy, like he doesn't, yeah, like he eats out a lot, but he's like, he's just a, he's just a quiet, really like shy person and he's lovely. And I don't know, I think it really hit me when he was like, I'm really sad that you guys are leaving. Um, and he said to me, people don't, talk to me in other restaurants the way that you guys talk to me. Um, everyone's so kind to me and I just have never found that anywhere else. And it really hit me that we kind of had made this safe place, not only for ourselves, but that that translated to our guests in a way that like people who would not normally feel seen anywhere else feel seen at Sayobo. And that was like, so powerful to me. You've uh, made the decision, the group's made the decision to close the restaurant. Can you take us through that time and, and, and that decision and, and how it played out? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think ultimately, um, you know, in conversation about the lease and renewing, all of that kind of stuff, um, I think, particularly Paul and I were just thinking about, again, that piece about sustainability, like we'd kind of created this restaurant that had finally become like the restaurant that we've always wanted. Um, But thinking about ourselves too and our own journeys, like I, I mean, I can't really speak for Paul, um, but for myself, I realized that, I had given everything that I had to say Obo and I felt um, like I I wanted to leave it in a way that I felt good about, you know, without any unfinished business. Um, And I think that, you know, going back to our conversation with, how coronavirus had affected me and that break and what that gave me. I think as a person, I realized it was okay to have boundaries and it was okay to say no. And um, it gave me that, I guess, the courage to say, I don't need to continue on this journey anymore as much as, you know, it, it, see, it does seem crazy to go out like at the point where we're honestly like we the last few months of Sayobo, even pef- before we had um, announced, have been our most successful financially to date in nine years. Wow. Like it's not even, it's not even like, oh, we feel really good about this you know, the restaurant and where it is, the numbers and the data support that in our percentages Mm. and how we reopen Sayobo, you know, the last quarter of the financial year pre-announcement, pre-us booking out, were the most successful that we've ever had. So 
you know, it does seem ridiculous that you're like, okay, cool, like we're done, we're out. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. For me, it's that idea of impermanence. Like at some point this is going to end, you know, like, whether it's going to be now or in five years or in 10 years or in 15 years or in 30 years, whatever it might be, nothing lasts forever. Um, and so for me personally, I was just like, well, I feel like I've done everything that I wanted to do here. And as much as I love this and because I love this, I need to walk away now. How, how have you felt after making that decision and, and now operating the restaurant? You've got a, a couple of months left still. Um, how, how are you feeling? Um, a bit of relief, to be honest, that now I, like, it's out there in the universe um, and I can kind of move forward um, without, you know, pretending that, you know, like, I don't know, I just, I'm such an open book that I wouldn't feel comfortable going on and not telling people about this decision. You know, I think that we were very conscious of taking care of our staff and making sure like they felt good and comfortable with the decision. Um, Obviously it's so bittersweet, you know, I, think that closer to the finish date I don't know how I'm gonna be I'm sure I'll be like much more of an emotional wreck and sad and all of that but right now like it's just the response has been incredible and overwhelming I thought we would get busy like that's how naive I was looking at this whole thing I'm like okay we'll announce like we'll get busy it'll be like pretty crazy but I didn't expect that we'd sell out of every table for the remaining three months within like 24 hours so wow yeah it was like I was like whoa whoa I was like we're gonna announce and I'm gonna turn my phone off and like just hope for the best like that obviously didn't happen and I was like on emails for like two days straight making sure that like things didn't explode on the reservation side and yeah, nothing got missed and, you know, like it. I, I was quite overwhelmed by the support that we received after, you know, announcing that we were going to close. And it feels really good to be able to go out on a high note and as a celebration, you know, I know that that is an incredibly privileged position to be in, especially at this, in this crazy time that we're all going through and you know considering all around the world restaurants are closing for the mere fact that they cannot open their doors so you know I I am very aware that we are you know we're standing in a very privileged position um but I don't know when when you have like last year when we closed the restaurant too and you get told that you're um you're non-essential and your job just vanishes and your whole industry vanishes. Like that's a really difficult um, thing to grapple with, you know? And so I think because Sayoba was such a special place, like for me, like I never want to see anybody take that away from us ever again. You know, I think that to do so on our own terms and go out the way that we want under our own terms and as a celebration on the highest note possible, like that's the, that's my, I guess, like maybe the, the gift back to Sayobo in that it deserves, it deserves the best possible goodbye that it can have. I know it's a pretty, um, emotional and interesting time and a lot going on, a lot to process and a lot of change. But have you had thoughts about life after Sayobo yet? Nah, not at all. (laughs) I haven't. Like people ask me that and I'm like, it's like saying goodbye to somebody you really love, you know, or breaking up with somebody and, you know, it's not on any bad terms, but 
you know you've got ex- three months together. Like I'm not thinking about my next boyfriend. I'm thinking about like <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about the love of my life that I'm got three months to be with, and that's all I'm thinking about. So, and I it it, it really is like that because I feel like I've been a, in a relationship with this restaurant for for ten years almost, and so the thought of like somebody else just is not on my radar right now because it's again like my heart is with Sayobo it always will be and I think it'll take me some time after Sayobo to be able to move on so yeah that's that's where I'm at it's like I'm I'm with Sayobo I'm present and I want to give it everything that I have in these three months. Well, um, Kylie, it's um, been amazing to catch up and what you guys have done for the Australian food industry is extraordinary. Um, and as you say, it's booked out for the next three months. Is there any way that people can get on a wait list in case people um, can't make dinner at all? Yeah, uh, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's an option to go on the notify list, but you do have to do it for an indiv- every individual night that you want to be on a wait list for. Um, but it's pretty like it's a very egalitarian system. So means that everyone's got a shot at getting it on getting a cancelled um um, reservation, sorry. So if you put your name on the list for a day and somebody cancels, you get a notification and whoever gets online first will get that reservation. Um, like it happened on Saturday night. Somebody like cancelled last minute just as we were opening our doors at 6 o'clock for the 8.30 reservation. And, yeah, somebody swiped the seat. Yeah, they, wow. they, yeah. Even in the weather, both her and her partner had put their name on the notify list, and they looked at each other. And he was like, "Do I want to get out of my pajamas?" And she was like, "You were going to get out of your pajamas." <laughs> and yeah, they said it was like two minutes later. They had like a quick conversation about whether or not they were going to come, and they they nabbed those two seats. So like, it does definitely happen, and it doesn't mean like you have to be the first person on that that wait list. Um, but just because like we've had an incredible number of phone calls and emails. Like we don't have a manual wait list. Cause again, like if one person's can going to cancel, like I have a list of 200 people that have emailed me. There's no way I'm going to be like, Oh, you, you're getting the golden ticket today. Like <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for that decision. So um, I, I much rather leave that to the computers to do. <laughs> well, as um, someone who's had some of the best meals of my life at your restaurant, I thank you. Uh, for what you've done for the Australian food industry. And um, thank you for sharing your story on Deep in the Weeds as well. Very much looking forward to what you guys do or what you do beyond um, Sayobo. But um, congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you. And I just, yeah, like I'm very grateful for, we've had some incredible support from so many people um, and, you know, like none of it would be possible without, people getting behind the restaurant and seeing the value in what we do. So, yeah, I'm very grateful for everybody who has come through our doors and, um, yeah, supported us along the way. It's it's meant a lot to, to all of us. So thank you. You're amazing. Thank you so much. And um, let's catch up soon. Yeah. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.